Hello, I'm Ed Callahan, lead pastor of Encounter Church, and welcome to session four of Driven. You can see all the sessions of Driven as well as the related messages and all the content at our website, EncounterChurchSTL.org. It's my prayer that you've been enjoying this series and that the Holy Spirit has been working in your life. I hope that we've built a bond of trust that, that will allow us to deal with a very, very sensitive subject here in session four. Say you're at dinner with a group of people and the server is inexperienced and only brings one check. Who pays? Is it this time that could be a really awkward experience as people look around trying to pick up on cues to see what everybody wants to do? How the check is divided is often based on the group. For example, are, are your parents there with you? If so, they've got it covered, right? Are there multiple families all at once there with you? Well, that, that's easy, right? You just divide the check amongst the families. Or is it a group of singles? And if so, everyone pays their own. Th those are easy scenarios. But what about when it's not so simple? Say it's a family with one or two families and friends in attendance. Or maybe it's a date where there was no discussion about who was going to pay the bill. We never want to be seen as cheap, but we never want to overpay. Right now, it seems like we're discussing a wallet problem, right? And that makes it a problem of the head, a problem of logic, math, even finance. But honestly, nothing could be further than the truth. Satan's tricked millions of people into believing that any time a pastor or a minister speaks about money, it's because the church wants more of your money to move from your account to their account. And nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, right now, we're discussing not a head problem, but a heart problem. Not a wallet problem, but a heart problem. Last session, we looked at purity, driven to purity. We asked, are your thoughts pure? Are your activities pure? We, we gave eight filters to run all that through to help you strive for purity, to be different, to be holy, can we apply the same standard to our heart in regard to finances, possibly? Because you see, it's, it's not at all about the money. This is a much, much bigger issue because it's a heart issue. And what we're really talking about is generosity. Generosity encapsulates the idea of giving freely. This is the idea of a closed versus an open hand. In a closed hand, nothing can be placed in it because it's closed. And neither can anything be taken away from it because it's closed. Yet, in an open hand, things can be placed in it and then removed freely from it. In an open hand, you're not trying to grasp or hold on to things that are in that hand. And that's one of the essential concepts of generosity. And that essential concept is Giving freely, giving freely. Generosity contains the idea of giving more than required. When you tip, do you only tip 10% or do you go over and above? When you're at work, do you put forth the minimum effort or do you go above and beyond the call of duty? You see, generosity includes the idea of giving abundantly. And it's not only ask you to do more than required, but generosity asks you to give extravagantly, sacrificially. Now, the Bible is full of fantastic examples. We spoke in the related message this past Sunday about how the Macedonians gave financially out of their poverty and gave abundantly. And throughout the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul giving generously of his time, even of his health, his talent, and everything he had to further the gospel. And in the Old Testament, Boaz gives generously of his fields and of himself for Ruth and Naomi. And all these pale, of course, in comparison to the generosity of our great God when he had demonstrated his love through Jesus on the cross for us. 
Go ahead and take some time now and simply reflect on the impact generosity has had on your life. It could have been a one-time event, or it could have been where you received ongoing help. It could have been money-related or something that someone did for you. Take some time. Discuss. How did someone's generosity help you? As you can see, generosity can make a huge impact, and it's often not even related to money. So why do pastors sometimes talk about money? Because it has such a direct path to the heart. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy began warning against false teachers who were preaching for wealth. Does this sound familiar? Uh, every one of us could probably name a preacher or two who's just simply in it for the money, and you know it. And that makes it so much more difficult for guys like me to speak about finances. But that doesn't mean we should shy away from it. Paul says in chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, Those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he goes on to say, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, you might say, Ed, I don't want to be rich. I just want what's mine. And, and if that's you and you just want what's yours, let me ask, are you living generously? Are you willing to give freely? Or are you grasping for things? Also in 1 Timothy, uh, Paul tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But that's so hard, isn't it, sometimes? Which is why God wants us to follow the example of Jesus and be generous. Let His love drive you to generosity. And to break the selfish hold of things, to get your focus on people and eternity. Jesus drives us to be generous. So how do we do this? How do we break the hold of material things and avoid the trap which leads to ruin and destruction? Let's be creative. Let's create a map to glory, an eternal investment portfolio of sorts. Now go ahead and take your study guide and you'll find a generosity map there. Go ahead and turn to that page. And no pun intended, but let's take stock of your resources and move forward with a giving plan. Okay? Have you found that page? All right, let's go ahead and begin. Your plan needs to be unique to you. It will and should be different than the person next to you. And that's okay. The important thing is that you're growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's start with how you spend your time. Now, we're going to generalize about your time, but please, you personalize it. You see, you can't grow if you're not honest with yourself and accurate about what you're writing down. Here we go. There's 168 hours in a week. And let's assume that you sleep eight hours a night. Wouldn't that be nice? And that brings you down now to about 112 hours still available. And let's again assume that 40 hours a week you're either at school or at work. And now you're left with about 72 hours left in your week, right? So let's throw in just those regular responsibilities of life that, that have to be taken care of you know, chores, managing the household, extra work, shoppings, errands, etc. You include those, and, and now that brings us down to about 50 hours in your week remaining. How do you account for those remaining 50 hours? I know we fill those hours up extremely fast. 
within those 50 hours, are you being generous with your time? Think about it. In those 50 remaining hours, do you help others, for example, when they need to move? Or do you put in the extra time at work when someone else is behind on a project? Do you help them? Or what about church? Do you serve at your church? What about your neighbor across the street, that, that single gal that needs help mowing her lawn? Do you help? You know, there's so many things that we can do that really don't require any special skills at all. They just require simply a little extra time. Speaking of time, sometimes we can get overwhelmed. So let me ask you, have you learned the power of the word no yet? Say someone asks you to be on a co-ed softball team, or your, your child wants to do another activity, or a friend wants you to come over to their house just for some fun time. Or maybe your church asks you to join a ministry to volunteer. You can say no. You can. You may be thinking, well, wait a second, we're talking about being driven to being generous, being driven to generosity. What? Isn't that the opposite of what we're talking about? It isn't that the opposite of what you're teaching on right now? Well, listen, it really isn't because there's a huge difference between generous giving of your time, your resources, big difference between that, generosity, and being busy. Big, huge difference between being generous and just simply the busyness of life, adding another thing to your schedule. You know, the difficulty of every person and every family has is simply figuring out that balance, that difference. And while many things only require extra time, some things do require specific skill sets. So let me ask you, what do you, specifically to you, uniquely to you, what do you know how to do? What's your skill set? Mine, you know, it used to be that I'm a fantastic accordion player, but I don't quite think that that's a skill set that's in high demand. <laughs> you know, while I wouldn't use the word fantastic, I have now laid enough flooring <laughs> that I could probably lend a helping hand to someone who needed some help playing some flooring. Let me ask you, what can you do and how are you generously using your skill set for others to benefit them? You know, at our church and counter church, there are E-teams for almost everything. We have an E-team that could utilize your skill set, that you can grow with that team in that skill set and see people all over raised to life in Christ. You know, while service does involve your church, uh, it shouldn't be the only place that you're serving. Serving out in the community, serving in your neighborhood. Some of you may say, hey Ed, man, I just don't know that I have a skill set. You may feel like you don't have any skill. You know, willingness, just simply being willing to help, that's a skill. Work ethic is a skill. It's, it's a trained discipline, right? You know, we're looking for people willing to be trained. We do e-rallies and training every week, every week. You know, if, if you're willing and you want to help, we'll find a place at Encounter Church for your talent. We'll plug you in through E101 and get you started. And as you th serve through your time and through your talents, through your skill set, generously giving of your personality will come alongside of you and train you and help you. You know, you're unique. You're a one of a kind. And your story is important. And the Holy Spirit will use your story, your talent, your skill set to draw people to the Father. The Holy Spirit will take your uniqueness, your story, and begin raising people to life in Christ through you. Through you. You have to believe that. And when you're with people, let me ask you, are you holding yourself apart or do you share who you are as a Christ follower with those around you? Sharing your story generously. You know, as we're, in, as we're generous with intangible things, it is equally as important to be generous with tangible things, not just intangible things. Are you generous with your stuff? Listen, for a long time, I was a proud boat owner. Yeah, I owned a boat. And I loved it. It was great. 
we take the family down to the lake, spend some time skiing, swimming, wakeboarding, tubing, or just joyriding around the lake. It was one of our favorite things to do. Uh, this boat was not something we would keep to ourselves, however. We used our boat for family, for friends, for vague acquaintances. Anyone who wanted to get out on the water was welcome to go with us on most of our trips. We took a lot of our neighbors to the lake just to get to know them. Even a church group or two from our student ministry or college would head to the lake and, and we'd work to get the boat there just so it could be used by them. Being generous with those, those tangible things, those tangible, not just the intangible, but the tangible, concrete things. Let me ask you, are the things that you own available for others? Now listen, that doesn't mean the neighbor should walk into your garage and take your tools without asking. That's not what we're talking about. And then you're hoping that that neighbor brings them back someday. But do you have the reputation as the person who will give the shirt off your back to the cold person standing next to you? Are you willing to suffer discomfort to fill the gap, to fill a need? Paul and Silas were willing to suffer discomfort while giving generously for another. This is an astounding, mind-blowing story. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. So, of course, what did they do? They began passionately adoring the Lord Jesus Christ. What else would you do if you've been thrown in jail? <laughs> and about midnight, while they're passionately adoring Jesus, an earthquake occurred which opened all the doors to the jail and knocked free the chains from all the prisoners. You know, to me, that would be a pretty clear sign from God that you are free to leave the premises. However, they chose instead to live generously and they gave abundantly of their time and they didn't leave. Instead, they stayed there. They stayed there. And when the jailer saw that all the doors had burst open because of this earthquake, he drew out his sword and prepared to kill himself, knowing that that was the penalty for a guard who let prisoners escape. But Paul and Silas gave of their personalities and they acted out of love for this jailer, this guard. And they had used their skills of speaking through the night and convinced all the prisoners to stay. Can you believe that? And by doing so, they freed this jailer, this guard, from the penalty that was upon him. Paul cried out. And what happened? They saw the jailer saved. The jailer was raised to life in Christ. You know, sometimes people feel like they're giving so much. Isn't it enough, you might think and you might feel? Can't I hold back now? And of course you can. You know, you serve a kind, loving, gracious, merciful God who has cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. But here's our challenge. You know, when, when you say, can I stop? H haven't I given enough? Here's, here's the challenge. When that happens, you begin just settling, settling in. But we're either going forward or we're going backward. We're either growing or we're slipping and losing ground. There's really no such thing in your spiritual walk or my spiritual walk as settling. And this is one of the reasons we're having two spiritual growth campaigns each year in order to help all of us take just a few weeks to build upon our unity so that we're on the same page, on the same mission together to see all people raised to life in Christ and to jumpstart growth again personally in our own lives. Will you live generously in your finances? How much are you supposed to give? How much can you keep? The problem with those questions is that it again makes it a money issue instead of a heart issue. And it's not about the money. It's about the attitude of the heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, lets us know that God loves a cheerful giver. And because God does love a cheerful giver, 
He never actually mandates in his word how much you should give. Instead, the Bible simply says to bring your tithes into God's storehouse. You see, the goal is to live with an open hand, not to grasp at money. Because I understand just how difficult this is, let me provide some benchmarks for all of us. Benchmark number one, give. Simply give something. Acknowledge that you need to give financially. That's the first step, the first benchmark. Give to your local church. Also, give to individuals, whether it's buying a co-worker coffee, buying coffee or a meal for a beggar on the street, uh, just, just start giving something and start giving something out of every paycheck. That's benchmark number one. Number two, begin to tithe. A tithe simply means a tenth of what you make. We see Abraham in the Old Testament giving a tenth to the high priest Melchizedek. That's in the book of Genesis. And it's kind of become the standard for giving in the local church. Some people in this benchmark ask, well, should I tithe before or after taxes? I would start with tithing after taxes. And then as you grow in this benchmark, increase your giving to before taxes. And then continue to give to individuals. Increase maybe to, instead of buying a cup of coffee, to buying someone's meal once a month. Benchmark number three, two or maybe four times a year, do some large, radical, crazy act of kindness. You know, maybe make a donation to a worthy cause or, or pay someone's bill who is in need. You could possibly purchase a large gift for someone just because. And now on to benchmark number four. Are you ready for this one? Benchmark number four, to give over and above your tithe. And when you start doing this, you, you have become that generous person, and especially with your money. You, you have learned how to have open hands where God can put what he wants in those hands because he trusts you, and you keep those hands open. You're not grasping for it, closing down on it. You keep them open, and, and you become God's conduit to meet the needs in other people's lives in order to see them raised to life in Christ. And man, is it fun. It's, it's great. I, I want this experience for everyone. Every Christ follower needs to be able to get to this place in their life. It is just, it's unbelievable. You know, about two years ago, uh, my wife, Bitsy, told me that she was not going to be cutting my hair anymore. And, and up to that point, almost our entire married life, she would cut my hair. So I had to go find somebody new and, and uh, found this young lady who had three daughters uh, one who was just going into college and the other two are in elementary school, a single young lady, working full time and then going back to school herself, raising those three daughters, getting ready to help pay for her daughter's college. And, you know, a uh, great hairdresser, uh, in fact. And the more I talk to her uh, every time I go to get my hair cut, the more I realize that she didn't know the Lord. And uh, so those first few times, I gave a good tip. And then about the fourth or fifth time, I dropped a $100 bill on her uh, to help her. And she was like, oh, no, I can't take that. I can't take that. And I said, absolutely, absolutely, man. You're trying to pay for your oldest daughter's college. You got the two young ones, and you're going back to school yourself. Man, absolutely. You know how fun that was to see her light up and to see someone's generosity, someone who believed in her and what God could do in her life. Listen, that was, that was a, a couple years ago. And being generous ever since, every time I go to my haircut, about two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, I'd scheduled to go get a haircut. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart that morning, just saying, Ed, today, today is the day to lay out the gospel. And so I did. I did. And as I shared Christ with her, how she could be raised to life in Christ because of the resurrection of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, she turned to me with her scissors in her hand. She paused and she said, Ed, I do believe. I do believe. And it was just that simple 
to her. What a glorious hallelujah moment. Her just simply saying, I do believe. She stepped from death to life. She was raised to new life in Christ. Now listen, part of her being able to come to that point in her life was the open hands and the conduit and God's blessings. How many people in your life could you see raised to new life in Christ as you get to the point of benchmark four, just being able to have those open hands where God can fill them and you just pass it on. He fills them, he pass it on. Some of you may see this step, this benchmark number four, and think, man, there's just no way I could accomplish this, this kind of generosity in my current financial situation. And you may be right. Most people in the United States are living paycheck to paycheck. No room for generosity in their financial giving. It takes hard decisions sometimes. You have to first decide, is it worth it? Is it worth living generously? You know, all the things I have asked you to give away so far are all paving the way so that you can be generous. Not only with your time, your skills, your talents, your resources, but so that you can be generous with your faith. With your faith. Seeing people be raised to life in Christ. Let me ask, do people just see Jesus in you as that cross on your keychain or the cross that you wear around your neck or the bumper sticker on your car? Or do they see Jesus in you because you share, you, you tell them about the love of Christ? You know, people are bombarded every day with words and images. Words and images telling them that they're unique, they're important, they're special. But then that follows up with, so buy this, you know, or, or buy that. When you get close and you start sharing with people, they're expecting you to ask them for something. But instead, you're going to wind up being that one person in their life that consistently, constantly is generous to them, giving to them. And not just giving, but giving freely and abundantly. Giving to the point that when you tell them about a God who wants to give them eternal life, abundant life, is a free gift, that natural skepticism that they have is put on hold. Is that worth living generously with your time? living generously with your skills, your talents, your personality, your material possessions, your finances? If so, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? For most of us, it's fear. You know, people are going to take advantage of me and being afraid of that. Yeah, they're going to try. Some people will try to take advantage of you. And that's where you have to remember that you do have the power of saying no, you know? It may require major changes to your lifestyle, and that may take time. Those are hard decisions. But let me tell you, you can't take it with you. Many people have tried, but you can't. So wouldn't you rather take a friend with you? God foresaw all of your struggles with finances, with money. He knows all all that you struggle with. He knows all that I struggle with. And let's close by this. There's a fantastic prayer in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30. It says this, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Live with an open hand. Give generously of all that you have and all that you are, so that through all things you might save some. 
Amen? May that be the mission of our lives so that all people will be raised to life in Christ. Let's pray.